Family history. The next day I expected to see Sanjo at one of the intermediate camps, but he wasn't hiding out in either one. This meant they had figured out a way to get him down to the porter camp, or else Captain Sheck had gotten his hands on him. Whatever his fate, I didn't have a lot of time to worry about it because our trip down to the base camp was a nightmare. Once again, the weather had warmed up, turning some of the glacial rivers into raging torrents. If we had boats and paddles instead of crampons and ice axes, we could have been down to base camp in minutes. By the time we reached the first intermediate camp, about half of our party was ready to give up and spend another night high on the mountain. We need to push on, Dietrich urged them. We need to get frostbite taken care of. We can be at base camp in three hours. Fortunately, no one else seemed to share his opinion, including the other Germans on his team, who I think blamed him for their summit failure. They sat on rocks, staring at him dully as if he lost his mind. But Dietrich was right. We were headed downhill. Even with their injuries, it wouldn't take long to get to base camp. I knew that they were tired and hurting. So was I. But spending another night at a crummy camp this close to base was stupid. The Sherpas appeared to be behind Dietrich 100%. None of them had even sat down to rest. I think Dietrich is right, I said. One of the Germans laughed. Ha ha! Now we have a child telling us what to do. Some of the others laughed with him. Ouch. I should have kept my mouth shut. I wasn't really in a position to tell them what to do, even if I was right. What's the matter with all of you? Someone behind us shouted. I turned around and was shocked to see Josh, and he wasn't alone. Bad weather coming in tonight, Zopa added. We cannot stay here. Josh was grinning, but I could tell he wasn't feeling well. His eyes were bloodshot, and he looked pale and haggard. He patted Dietrich on the back. Sorry about the trouble up on the mountain. Dietrich looked like he was ready to cry. I wasn't sure if it was from grief over the dead climbers or relief that Josh and Zopa had shown up to give him a hand. Josh walked over to the sitting climbers. If we leave right now, we should be able to get down before dark. We have a team of doctors waiting to treat you. Hot food. Get up. Let's go. No one was laughing at Joshua Wood. I remember what my mother said about there being no one better than Josh when you are at the end of your rope. He was obviously sick. But here he was encouraging climbers who weren't even members of his own expedition. Slowly, one by one, they started to get to their feet. Zopa took the lead with Dietrich. Josh and I followed behind. How was camp for? He asked tiredly. Any problems? It was hard, but not as bad as I thought it would be. My ribs hurt from trying to get enough air. No worries, everyone goes through it. Zopa says that you're ready for the summit. It was one thing for Zopa to give me some words of encouragement, after a hard climb. It was another thing for him to tell Josh that I was ready to summit. I didn't know what to say. At that point, the summit seemed like too big of a subject to tackle, and maybe even bad luck to talk about it. I think Josh knew how I felt, maybe better than I did, because he didn't say any more about it. The squirt of paranoia from a few days before seemed to have evaporated. What happened with Zopa and Captain Sheck? I asked. A mini-revolution. As soon as the porters and the Sherpas heard about Zopa's arrest, they all gathered around Sheck's headquarters to hold a silent vigil. They were there when the chopper landed. Sheck tried to disperse them, but they wouldn't budge. He hauled Zopa into the building, hoped to outweigh them, but that didn't work. They'd still be there if they hadn't cut Zopa loose. He had no choice but to let him go. And Sanjo? That's the best part. Sheck pulled all the soldiers back to headquarters, which makes it easy to sneak Sunjo back to the porter camp. If he hadn't detained Zopa, I'm not sure how we would have gotten Sunjo off the mountain. He might have had to stay at one of the intermediate camps until we tried for the summit. Why is Captain Sheck so worried about him? I think he knows more about what we're trying to do than what he is saying. Well, how do you find out? Josh shrugged. It's hard to keep a secret up here, even if everybody keeps their mouth shut. Speaking of which... He slowed down. Your mom called. The grin was gone. His easygoing mood had completely changed. Why did you write her? He asked. Because she wrote to me. I said a little more belligerently than I intended. I guess my mood had changed too. Josh looked confused. 
I knew the one day that I'd have this conversation with him, but I didn't think it would be at 20,000 feet with him sick and me so tired I could barely lift my feet. But I guess there's no ideal time or place for something like this. I thought we had an agreement, he said. I thought we were going to let me handle your mother. There was no agreement, I said. I didn't think anyone could handle my mother. We glared at each other. The least you could have done, he said, was to tell me that you wrote her, so I wasn't blindsided. Well, the least you could have done is write me back. What the hell are you talking about? I sent you letters. You mean when you were a kid? Yeah. So? You got the letters? I shouted. He stopped and pulled his goggles around his neck. Yeah, I got your letters. What does that have to do with telling your mother about Everest? Everything, I said. He didn't get it, and he didn't seem to care. Well, she's royally pissed off, he said. It's all I could do to stop her from flying over here and yanking you off the mountain. At least I think I stopped her. She wants you to call her as soon as you get to base camp. Fine, I said. She insisted that I take you to the top myself, which screws up everything. I'm either going to have to go with you and Sunjo, or you'll have to join my team which means there will be a long delay in your summit attempt because it looks like we'll be the last team to go, and I'm in no shape to climb, and neither is anyone else on this team. Lucky you have a backup in Sunjo, I said. Either way, you'll get the youngest climber in the world to summit. Is that what this is about? He asked. You're mad because it's not about just you anymore? It was never about me, I said. It's always been about you. I walked away from him. Past the injured climbers, past Dietrich, past Zopa, arriving back at base camp a half an hour before any of them. I barged into the AQ, grabbed the sat phone, and punched the number as I stomped over to my tent. Mom answered on the first ring. Peek? I got a little choked up when I heard her voice, and it was a second or two before I could respond. Hi, Mom. Silence. That went on so long that I thought I'd lost the connection. You should have told me, she finally said. I was tempted to say that I had told her in the mole scheme, but I knew that that wouldn't fly. Sorry, I said. Well, that didn't sound very sincere, but I accept it. How did you do at Camp 4, she asked quietly. I was shocked at how calm she was. It was hard, I answered, but I'm good. Your ribs okay? A little sore, but yeah, they're fine. You're not mad? Furious. That was more like it. But she didn't sound furious. Josh told me you were sick. I'm over it. But a lot of others have had it now, including Josh, but I didn't tell her that. I know, she said. Since I got your journal, I've been surfing the Everest websites. Looks like a lot of climbers are leaving the mountain. I also read about the deaths at Camp 6. I walked down the mountain today with the German team leader, I told her. His name is Dietrich. And how is he? I don't know. Devastated, I guess. And how are you? What do you mean? Well, four people died less than a mile away from you, she said, sounding a little more like my mother. Any thoughts on that? Feelings? Reaction? I didn't know what to say. I feel bad. I didn't know what to say. I feel bad. Didn't quite cut it. Mom was just getting warmed up. Four people died on the mountain. Human beings, Peek. With mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, children, wives, husbands, girlfriends, boyfriends, sitting at home worrying about them. And by now they've gotten a phone call or an email with the bad news. Sorry your husband, wife, daughter isn't coming home. No, we can't retrieve the body above Camp 4. It's too dangerous. I reached my tent and climbed inside. Let me ask you a question, she said. Go ahead. Do you think you're a better climber than the four who died? No. Do you think you're luckier than they were? I guess, I said. I'm alive. That's not what I'm getting at. You're saying the same thing could happen to me. You're not on the wall in the back of our cabin at the climbing camp. You're on Everest. People die up there, Peak. You might die. The guys who died weren't acclimatized, I protested. They should have waited. They saw a break in the weather and got summit fever. They made a mistake. You think that means anything to those who were waiting at home for them? I looked up at the drawings that the two P's had sent. Well? 
Mom persisted. One of the drawings was a stick figure, clinging to a skyscraper with a helicopter hovering overhead. Just above the stick figure was a little blue mountain. I'm trying for the summit, I said. I've gone through too much to give up now. This was followed by a longer silence than the first. I wish you wouldn't do it, Peek, but I'm not surprised by the decision. I know what I would have said to my mother if I were on Everest, getting ready for the climb of my life. She rarely talked about her parents. They still lived in Nebraska, and I had met them only twice. It wasn't much fun either time. They didn't approve of Mom, me, Josh, Rolf, or even the two Ps. Mom had left home right after high school and never lived there again. I'll be careful, I said. No one climbs a mountain thinking that they're not coming back down. How are the two Ps? I asked. You're changing the subject. Yeah, Mom sighed. Hang on a minute. About 30 seconds later, the sat phone earpiece was filled with a pair of screaming, giggling six-year-olds. Where are you? When are you coming home? I miss you. No, I miss you. Did you get our letters? Mommy was mad at you. Are you coming home for our birthday? This went on for a while, and I just listened with a big, stupid grin on my face. Until I heard them, I hadn't realized how much I missed them. Mom finally took the phone away from them. Okay, okay she said. You have to let Peek answer your questions. I'm going to put him on speakerphone. You two are going to sit there quietly. If you make a sound, the phone calls over. I heard a click. I miss you too, I said. I'm on a big mountain called Everest in a country called Tibet. I have your drawing hanging up in my tent. I'm looking at it right now. I'm not sure if I'm going to be there for your birthday or not. I have to get to the top of the mountain first. Can I ask Mommy? Patrice asked. Yes, but only one question. Then Paula can ask a question. Then you both need to go back to the kitchen and finish your breakfast or you'll be late for school. But, no, Mom cut her off. One question each, then back to breakfast. Do we have a deal? The twins reluctantly agreed. Did you get our letter? Patrice asked. The heavy one? Not yet, I said but I'm sure it's on its way. The mail is very slow where I am. My turn, Paula said. Mommy gave your black diary to Mr. Vincent. I hope he likes it, I said. He's funny, Paula said. Okay, that's it, Mom said. But I didn't ask a question, Paula complained. We had a deal. Both of you go back to the kitchen. There was some grumbling and whining, but the two peas obeyed. What time is it there? A little after eight in the morning. I hadn't even thought about what time it was. Mom had probably been waiting all night for my call. How's Rolf? He's out of town on a business trip. He'll be back tonight, and he's going to be upset that he missed your call. Mom sighed. Peek, I gave it my best shot to try to talk you out of trying for the summit. But now the decision has been made. You need to focus on the task. You can't think about me, Paula, Patrice, Rolf, or anyone else. To stay alive, you are going to have to think only about yourself. Do you know why I quit climbing? Yeah, I said. You fell from the wall in the back of... No, she interrupted. I quit because of you. What? With some work, I could have gotten my climbing condition back. In fact, the reason I went for that climb the day was because Josh wanted me to get back on the circuit with him. Just before I fell, I was thinking about what would happen if a rattlesnake slithered up to my baby strapped in his car seat down below. If I'd been thinking about the climb, I would have realized the rock I grabbed was loose before I put weight on it. To climb at Josh's level, you have to be completely selfish, Peek. When you were born, I couldn't do that anymore. I have no doubt you have the physical ability to summit Everest or any other mountain that you want, but you may not have the ability to not care. For the next few weeks, you have to harden yourself inside. Your guts and heart need to be stone cold. I didn't do a lot of high altitude when I was climbing, but I did enough to know that the thin air messes with your brain. You need to forget everything else and concentrate on the climb. You have enough experience to know when it's over. And when it's over, don't take another step higher. If you do, it could be over for good. Turn around. There's no shame in it. Live to climb another day. And when you come back down, I hope that good and caring heart of yours thaws. It's the most important muscle that you have. 
I love you, Peek. And with this, she cut the connection. I don't know how long I lay there thinking about what she said, but I can tell you there was plenty of tears. As the blue light through the tent faded to dark, I was still lying there when the flap opened. It was Josh. You have the sat phone? I sat up. Yeah. Sorry. I should have brought it back. I gave it to him. So you talked to your mom? Yes. One thing we need to get straight, he said. Getting Sunjo to the top is not a backup plan. I'm giving him a shot because I owe him and Zopa. What do you mean? Two years ago, Kitar saved my life. Sanjo's father? Up on K2. You were the climber who survived? We'd been snowed in for three days. No food, no O's, no hope of survival. I watched my climbing party die one by one until I was the only one left. I should have been next. But Kitar came up the mountain through the worst blizzard I've ever seen. He came alone. None of the other Sherpas would come with him. He all but carried me back down. When we got to base, we stumbled into the aid tent. I took one cot. Kitar took the other. While Leo was treating my frostbite and giving me IV fluids, the man who saved my life died not four feet away from me. His heart gave out. I didn't even get a chance to thank him. I thought you ought to know. He closed the flap, and I heard his footsteps crunching through the snow as he walked away.